Okay, so uh, welcome. Um, so first of all, uh, an apology, because this is a very last minute talk. Uh, this is only really decided in the last couple of days that there was a slot on what, on what we would do. So this is why there's a lack of information uh, as to what's going on here. So uh, I apologize for that. Um, so it's a surprise talk, and hopefully it'll be a pleasant surprise and nothing else. Right, first of all, so what is this talk about? Why do I want to give this talk? Well, I do architecture work for people, so I look at the way people put stuff together. Uh, and I've seen a lot of things that I just think, really, we're missing the point. Uh, I see a lot of people who think that read and write are actually the same thing, and they don't consider the differences. They consider REST APIs to be really good things, and they use them in inappropriate ways. Um, and so we're going to look at a number of aspects uh, of uh, things around, around that area. Um, so here are some of the things I wanted to talk about. Read and write, we all know what they are. Do we actually really consider what they are and the differences between them? Because they are really quite different in the way they behave and the way they affect our systems and the way we design systems. Business processes, what do we do about rules and schemas and other things like that? How does that fit into this big area of, of APIs and where things go and what do we do with validation and, and other aspects of that one? I wanted to speak a little bit about performance and scalability and concurrency and the fact that read and write really don't scale in the same way at all. What happens there? So these really will see that read and write are very different in the way that they affect your systems. Um, asynchrony, I want to look at queuing of systems, what that means, what that means for things like your reliability and other aspects of this one, uh, synchronicity of things, failover and other things. An important one at number five is structure changing, which is the way that we structure our data. Um, it's something that I've seen increasingly in lots of systems, and now I start seeing it, I see it everywhere. I'll come on more to that. Things like CQRS and other things come into this aspect. And then a little bit about state management. So it's a sort of kind of <sighs> series of things around read and write. Well, OK, read, write. We know what these ones are. Have we considered the differences between reads and writes? So reads are very simple. So I have, uh, if I'm trying to read something from here, I'm pulling data out of this thing X like this. I can put a lot of caches in the, in the way. This is great. I can cache it. This, now this is applicable at every level. So this could be, so this can be an L1 cache, an L3 cache inside your machine. It can be memcache or Redis. It can be web caches and proxies. It can be CDNs. There's all sorts of other things. This is a general architectural pattern. It scales. It scales very nicely. It's mostly transparent. Most of the time with reads, you don't need to know about caching. There are obviously some things we have to deal with here about cache coherency and expiry and other parts of this one. But on the whole, most of the time, you don't think about it. It just goes faster. Life's better. Idempotence, so, or idempotent, however you wish to pronounce it. Idempotence means you do something once or more than once and you get the same result. Turning on a light switch is idempotent. If I turn the light switch on 10 times, it's the same as turning it on once. If I read something 10 times, I should get 10 times the same answer rather than just once. So we can retry it without side effects. For instance, on HTTP of the four verbs, get is, just, is idempotent, put is idempotent, delete is idempotent, but post isn't. It's the only one that isn't idempotent. We can partition data. We can partition, we can shard, we can split it on primary key. That's very easy to do when you want to start scaling your system, as long as you're looking at primary keys. Now, this can be done at database level. This can be done as sharding inside your application at a threading-based level. So if you've got eight cores, you might shard your data across eight cores or eight threads in order to avoid the contention within threads. Most of the time, the business rules are just about access control. Who can read something? Who can read this data is very important. I spend a lot of time in architecture things trying to work out what the access control and the authentication and authorization are. But we only really have to deal with those set of rules. There are plenty of other rules that we'll deal with in a moment. It's synchronous. <clears throat> it blocks. Most of the time, you say, I want this thing, and then you wait. 
You can do it with callbacks. If you're writing sort of kind of Node.js and event-driven things, you say, I want that one. You can use await, promises, futures, whatever language you happen to be in. You can do that and that. But that's essentially a blocking wait. All that happens with those async things is that you allow the apparatus to go off and do something else and then come back. But you, on your thread or uh, your caller, appear to block. You're also scaling bandwidth really nicely because you go, yeah, I just go here. As I go here, I just keep adding bandwidth. And I get more bandwidth, more bandwidth. And I got more CDNs and everything else, more points of presence. It just gets, it, it scales sideways. It's great. It's a wonderfully scalable thing. Reads are really nice for that point of view. But somebody at some point has to write something. And the trouble with write is it's actually coming into one point. This is now, this is great. This is fan out. This is fan in. Writes do not scale in the same way at all because you're all trying to get to the same thing. How do I go and update that record in the database? I can't partition that record. I can only have it in one place. Caching doesn't help you with this. In fact, it makes things horribly worse. Caching is really good on here, but actually from a writing point of view, it makes it horribly worse. Why? Because if I put a cache in front of here, where is the data? Is it in the cache? Is it in this thing? If this guy's got a cache as well, do they see the same thing or not? How do I keep those synchronized? This is state management. This is one of the nasty things that you have to deal with in larger systems. Mm. So let's, let's have a look at write and think that it's not quite the same. How do you scale it? Well, you can scale it for different ones. I can say, well, that partition has this thing. And then I can write on that one. That's fine. I've scaled them because I've, got, I've removed the contention but I can't scale access to the same thing. That's one of the problems, because everything's coming into one point rather than going outwards. Sharding works, as I said, it works well if you have primary key writes. If I'm trying to write here or write there or write that record, it's fine. No SQL on a key value store, that's great. What happens if I need to write across multiple things, across multiple shards? This gets horrible quite quickly. Reads have access control routes, rules. Writes have as well. Who can write something? And now we need all the update rules saying, is this a valid update or not? We've got more business logic on modifications than we have on reads. It's much harder to do. So writes are really kind of the, the hard part. Some compensations, we can delay it. It can be asynchronous. I can say, yeah, OK, do that one there, and then just write it in the background. I can't just say, put this read in the background. It, I have to wait for it. So you get some asynchronous aspects to this one. Identifiers for reads basically just happens without you trying. For writes, you now have to, it's a design decision. It's your choice. You have to put in, how do I do once and only once with this one? I need to put IDs in there. I need to have some, or timestamps. I need to have this kind of thing of saying, update if not all done already kind of thing. Um, that's something that you have to decide uh, if you're um, a, uh, a, an implementer of this one. How are you going to do that one? Is it important? If I overwrite it, does it matter? Some things it does, some things it doesn't. If you're doing transactional stuff, if it involves money, people, for some strange reason, get fussy about money. I don't know. You also now have dependencies. Dependencies are one of the fun things. They make testing that much more difficult. They are coupling, whether it's shared knowledge or uh, directly with compile time dependencies or runtime dependencies. If I have a box in the middle like this with input and output, well, one of the things here, we have simple, this is very simple. We've got reading and writing here causing dependencies, but it's asymmetric. This guy here, X, doesn't know who calls him. That's fine. I don't need to worry about this side. But an outbound dependency is always the thing that's going to cause us fun. Because I have an outbound dependency, I have to know who that is. So my, right, my outbound writes have dependencies with my inbound reads don't. This introduces also the notion of pushing and pulling. Now in code, you look at that and go, well, OK, that's very simple. But um, is x pulling from the input? Or is the input pushing into x? Similarly, that one here, what's going on? We'll look at this in a bit more, um, and I'm going to try and uh, point out that I think this is probably 
that, that diagrams like this aren't actually very helpful. Oh, here I start on REST APIs. OK, here the fun comes. Um, if I have a REST API here that just sort of kind of does get and put and all those other kind of things like that, where are the business rules? Well, if it's just basically SQL crud over the web, which is essentially what most REST APIs that I get to see, unfortunately, do, is that you end up with the business rules in the client about what you can and can't do. Now, I did, this is not ideal, of course, uh, but uh, often I see this one here. Uh, so it's really an anti-pattern if you're not careful. REST API, thinking REST APIs are a good thing, they can be, but be careful. You may end up having a lot of duplication of rules. What happens here is we've essentially separated code and data. This is getters and setters. So I, even if I do have some rules down here, what am I doing? Why am I getting this? And why would I have a set here? Because I'm then getting into getters followed by doing some modification and setters. Getters and setters are an anti-pattern in, in, in most code. Um, and this is a, just a, a larger scale version of it. It's unencapsulated. It doesn't hide knowledge. It spreads knowledge around. So if you're a fan of OO, then you'd say this is horrible. I don't necessarily say that OO is the best thing, but it does spread knowledge around. And if you've come across the, the OO thing, which is tell, don't ask, you go, yeah, I want to tell that object to do something. Don't ask it for the data. Try and do it for it and hand it back again. REST APIs are essentially just a network version of give me the data, I'll make some decision and hand it back if you're not careful. You should be trying to push. Why should you be trying to tell it to do something? This is actually where SOAP, even though from a technical point of view it was a horrible thing, was much better because it actually had, and gRPC is a sort of kind of rep, um, replacement for that. You go, here is something I want you to do. You have verbs, you have objects, you can do that one, but turning everything basically into public data, which is what REST does, doesn't really help you. As an example, here, maybe I've got something with stock level. Stock level should always be greater than zero. If I end up with minus one item on the shelf, where is the problem? Who got that wrong? Grep is now your friend, or grep across multiple things, because somebody somewhere here didn't do the rules right. Or you, have to be, or you need to put some rules in here and decide what should happen. Where is the bug? And then you go, well, OK, now I'm going to start moving rules and schemas and other things around. Um, and in the, in the sort of kind of world of big data and other things like this, you see these kind of terms. Am I going to have enforce a schema on write? Am I going to say, yeah, I'm always going to write valid data here, uh, and then I put the rules up here? That's one choice. You enforce only writing valid data in here. Um, quite a lot of the time, you'll have things like schema on read, no SQL, things like Mongo and other stuff. Yeah, yeah, write whatever you like. I'll just have to pick, I'll just pick out the pieces later on. That can actually be very useful for migration. You go, well, that was version one, version two, I've had an extra field, I don't care. If you uh, look at things like XML and JSON, they typically ignore fields that they don't know about. So can, as long as you're not running validation, you can say, I want these six fields, you give me a seventh, I don't care. So that's uh, another choice you have to think about. But also, are you going to end up actually putting a schema in here and the rules down here, which is really the sort of kind of SQL and an object-oriented version. So where does your schema go? Because read and write are not the same. Do you want read to do it? Do you want write to do it? Or do you want neither to do it? Up to you. So those are some, uh, some options. One of the other things about straight kind of RESTful APIs is that they really don't have much in the way of state machines or processes. So if you look at the state chart for a REST API, it has create, post or put, read and update and delete. Your CRUD operations, that is the state chart. They have no state information. I don't know of many business processes that are that good. That works for reference data. If you go, yeah, I'm just going to write this thing, countries of the world, currencies, that makes sense. I don't see any reason I have to do much with that. But most of the things I need to do with order management and other things have multiple states and retry loops and other things like that. And then I end up having to go, well, what am I going to do now if I try to represent this with a REST API? I think REST is overused. 
is kind of the point you're getting, I hope you're getting from this one here. I want to be able to model this state chart. How do I do it? Well, maybe I need different entities for each one of these. Or maybe this is one entity with nested things inside it. But then we're sort of kind of trying to force fit this into that model, which is based around the protocol that we're using. If you're using HTTP verbs to do this one, you have to go, well, I'm now bending my data model and my business process to try and fit my protocol. That seems the wrong way around. So if you're not careful, what you end up with REST saying, basically, look, I've got micro data stores. I haven't got microservices because they've got no implementation. They've got nothing here. They may have a few bits of rules and other things, but on the whole, I've often seen them used just as, as essentially SQL with an HTTP interface, web dev um, under a different name. OK, enough of REST bashing. We'll come back to that. Let's look at system scaling. Here is the typical story that I see. You start off, your application is too slow, so you go, right, we'll put more web servers on. So that's great. You scale the front end like this, and you're scaling the read and the write. Uh, and then you go, OK, I've scaled up the front end, and now I'm kind of, the, this, the back end is slowing me down. So you get a bigger database. Ah, so you do this one here. But quite quickly, you find out that scaling the database doesn't actually get you that far. Uh, you, you end up with a sort of kind of 32 gig, well, the big sum monster machine with 32 cores and the largest box you can get on Amazon and whatever, uh, you kind of even run out of that because you have got all the problems with it being in one place and lack of distribution, etc. So you, you go, well, actually, next what we're going to do is we're going to add extra caches. So you start thinking, now we add in memcache and Redis and other things to try and take off the reads because actually we want more reads than writes, but we sort of scaled, we can't scale the read and write independently, uh, sorry, together like this because we've run out of writes. So the read scaling, we have to do that with extra caching, uh, sort of kind of web level. Uh, and then you sort of think you can get around there, and that's fine. And then you run out of, of write bandwidth. So you then start having to shard. So you start trying to shard the database, or you start moving to NoSQL and all of the, uh, the downsides of that as well. So then the next one is you go, well, actually, oh, really don't, why don't we split this one up? Split this up into pieces, and then you stop trying to share everything through the database. So this is really the story of the, uh, of the big database in the middle um, pattern, anti-pattern, that I often see. E-commerce companies seem to be very uh, keen to do this one here. They build a monolith around a database. Uh, and the database becomes the home of everything because it's very easy just to add something in, but they never actually split it up. Often they get down to this point and have all the pains of that. Um, if you try microservices, we get some other pain, uh, problems. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, here you'll notice you end up, once you start splitting it up, you end up not being able to do joins anymore directly in the database. So you have to do them in the components themselves and try and do that. So there are problems as you go down this one here. But that's a sort of kind of problem path that I see for scaling because read and writes don't scale independently. So partitioning, sharding works to an extent. Strong bias around the primary key, that's great. It works really well for things like customer, um, order, uh, product. So you can see why e-commerce companies will like that one. But if you're trying to do analytics, you're trying to do stuff across lots of different things, a non-transactional system, uh, non-transactional data, then, it, then sharding doesn't help you that much. So scaling cost partition. How do you deal with writes when you're trying to run across multiple ones? You end up having to do distributed transactions, other things like that. This is a whole world of pain. Ian Cooper was talking about this yesterday. Um, and you then end up with um, the problems that you get with distributed systems. There's a paper in 1994 by Keith Waldo from uh, Sun, who's one of the guys who was involved in Sun and helped in things like Java and other bits and pieces. And there are, uh, why is, why are distributed systems different to in-memory systems? Well, you get partial failure. It's one of the biggest problems. Is you go, well, I sent you something. Did you get it or not? The old UDP joke about, I would tell you a UDP joke, but I wouldn't know if you got it. Um, so this one here is partial failure. You don't know about that one. You've got cross-box box transactions. You also introduce concurrency where you didn't have it before. Because as soon as you go across a network, you'll find the other side is concurrent. It's not in process anymore, so you have to take that into account. You've got difference in latency. 
the thing over there is far slower than the thing in here. This is, this is nanoseconds or microseconds. That's milliseconds away, so several orders of magnitude different. Um, if it's in memory, you can just use pointers and references. If it's, a, if it's on the other side of that one, pointers don't work anymore. Um, so it's an interesting, uh, interesting paper to read, by the way. We want to try and align our service boundaries with our failure. What we don't want to have is a service, a service or a transaction that will multiple transactions inside one thing. If those don't line up, you're in problems. If you have the, you've all had the experience of, oh, can I have the last airline seat, please? Yes, and then trying to book it and find it's gone. And that's a problem where you've got, actually, look, the failure, I've got two transactions with a, a window in between. You really want to be able to say, book if it's there. You need to try and align those. The other thing is that if you have things like REST APIs, watch out for, or OO-based systems, the N plus one database problem. Get me a query for all the things I want, please. OK, here's 120 things. You then may have to make 120 calls to go and get the things themselves. If you're not careful, you end up with 121. So you end up with 120 calls N plus the one to go and find out what it is. If you're using SQL, you'd say, can I just go and do them all in one, please? Because you can do set-based stuff. It's something people often forget when they deal with REST and other things is bulk data, bulk operations, reporting and the like. REST doesn't work for that. ORMs. Uh, object relational management things can cause all sorts of problems with that as well. Um, if you want to talk about, um, about the fun of uh, sharing and, and mutable data and why writes don't scale, I can go off into that if you want. But the primary thing is what Kevin and Henry would refer to as the synchronization quadrant. If you have immutable data, it doesn't matter what you do with it. You can share it, you can not share it, no locks, not a problem, because it's immutable. If you're not sharing it, that's not a problem. If it's shared and mutable, you have a problem. You have to try and keep these together. This is where thread safety, this is where all these other, other things come from. Mutable data is the sh uh, shared mutable data, evil, nasty stuff. You can do all the read-only stuff without that one. If you have things like const or final in your language, that's always a good thing to be using. See if you can do that. If that moves you more to a functional paradigm, great. If you use pu pure message passing, most of this will go away anyway, although you have got some of the issues about what happens with changing uh, data once it's outside a system on somewhere else. Oh, so just to wake you up, um, I've picked, um, picked this. This was just sort of a another random architecture diagram I found on the web. Um, it's not here to try and prove anything. Um, how many of you have seen stuff like this or have to work with this? Yeah, you go, yeah, it's a lot of that. When you go, do you, do you understand it? I don't. I see these all the time and going, right, OK, there's, um, there, there's a load of databases and there's some stuff happening here and going backwards and forwards. Shows connections. Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you. And then you see this lovely thing. Arrows show connections. They do not indicate data flow. Do you have any idea what's going on here? I don't. I'm trying to work out when I look at this one here going, OK, this really just gives me a physical idea that stuff is happening. And even with this soap thing here, I have no idea. OK, it says soap. Well, that's the start uh, of finding out what's going on. I don't know if it's pull or push. If it happens, this is an incremental update. Is it a full updated? Is this asynchronous? Uh, what's going on? Do I have queues in here? What's, what's happening? Really, these kind of diagrams, I think, are absolutely, well, they, do, they, they, they tell you some boxes. Maybe it helps me to ask some other questions. If I ever write or draw a diagram like this, I certainly try to have fewer arrows than this and fewer numbers of data stores. But I will then, as an architect, go through and go, each one of these, what is happening on each line? So I've then got a table. I've said, this line does this. It's this protocol. It's this often, this amount of data, this one. I want to be able to see. I want to know what's happening so I can document all that lot. But in general, I find these kind of documents, everybody has them on the wall. And you go, what's that about? So this kind of thing, just x and y like that, and an arrow, is going like, how much use is that? Well, it tells you probably x and y have something to do, but I have no idea. Uh, is x reading y, or is it writing to it? Or is it at different times? Does it read it and then write it back again? This is not telling you anything. Is it a push or is it a pull? Where is the control? 
if this is in a programming language, is this an active object? Is the thread of control here? And in pushing it, is the thread of control here? And this is, is this an active object, or are they both passive and it's some thread that's running between the two of them? I don't know. If this is a distributed system, and this is my order, this is my front-end e-commerce, this is my back-end product catalog, am I doing a full batch update? Am I pushing across 20,000 products, uh, uh, all the SKUs, or am I just doing the ones that have changed? What are the consequences of having just one or two changing or everything else? So is this, uh, is this a push and, is this a fire and forget? Does this push us asynchronously and say, yeah, it happens there at some point or whatever? Don't know. It's kind of a start, but it really doesn't give you enough actually to understand or design the systems. It just, it's just a way of, 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 well, maybe start of a conversation. So full versus incremental. One of the things about full changes, so if I'm going to do, here's the entire product catalog every night or whatever I choose to do. There are some big advantages to this one. It stops buildup of errors. If you have incremental change, you're thinking, okay, I've, I've added this one, I've added that one. Did you miss one? And if you've missed one of those incremental changes, when are you going to find out and when are you going to get it back again? Is it manual repair at that point? because you just happen to be offline at the time when the change happened. In a distributed system, that's really, really kind of hard to do, to get right. You end up having to do all sorts of things with sequence numbers and other things. It, it becomes quite difficult to do. In some ways, just a full update every time makes much more sense. Yes, it's slower and it has longer latency, but actually it gets rid of all these sort of kind of things about partial failure and other things. It's just one big transaction. You go, right, okay, start transaction, import 20,000, whatever, 20,010, whatever it is now, like this, one transaction, ka-chunk. It has some advantages. Incremental changes are fast, and you can get them immediately, and you don't suffer the long latency of, well, actually, yes, you made that change, but you can't have it until tomorrow until it's gone through the batch process. It's trade-off time. Yes, that's what happens when you're doing architecture. You don't get to get what you want. You just have to decide which is the least worst option. But you don't have the guarantee of that one, lost messages and the transactionality aspect of it. So this leads into things like the Lambda architecture. I don't know if you've come across Lambda architecture. Um, this is uh, something that has sort of come out of the, the big data world, uh, where you go, right, OK, I have my data like this one. I have essentially my immutable data. So I have all them. This is actually all the data that I have there. And then I do some big batch recompute, and I compute all the views that I want here. This is essentially my slow path. But it takes everything every time. So from an architectural point of view, this might be uh, been looking at systems like this where I write all the stuff into S3. And then I take a big crunchy thing, whether it could be uh, Hadoop type stuff or Athena query or whatever, say, right, I'm going to pre-compute everything from that. Then I get, oh, look, new data comes in. Instead of waiting for this one here, which is saying, well, I've got, how, I've got this long latency problem, but I want to get updates like this, what do you do? Well, you actually have a separate path for updates. And you go, well, here's my updates. This is real time. Here's my incremental views. And then essentially, when you query, you say, ah, well, I'll look here. If it's not there, I'll look there. So you've actually got two rates of change. This is, this is the speed layer, as it's referred to. This is the batch layer, and the serving layer mi and mixes these two together. It can be very useful. Um, I was working on a system, and I'll show you bits of it, uh, or it, it comes later on, where basically I said to the client, I'm not going to have incremental updates. I, I argued very strongly. I said, I want to have hourly updates, please. Why do I want to hourly updates? Because then I could completely eliminate all this lot. I didn't have any immediacy or anything. Everything could go immutable through that whole thing. Much simpler. Much simpler. If you can go for immutability, that's great. OK, I've had a good, good kicking of, of, uh, of read and write and REST uh, APIs. Um, so what do I suggest instead? Well, if you have read and write, together like this, and they're calling one API up and down like this. This is what I refer to as the vertical thinking in this talk. Um, what I'd rather have is, well, actually, look, this is writing stuff, and this is reading it. Can we, un can we unwind that and then put it like this, please? This is writing data into here, and then data's going here. I'm reading it. 
This is much more horizontal. This is much more flow-based. What, what I see here is that actually these are quite different, and they're different business processes. Somebody's writing product data, and somebody else is reading product data. Wouldn't it be nice if we actually could see that? If you go back to this and I go, who's writing what's reading? I can't see any of this one. What I really like about modern cloud native ones is I go, I can actually build my system like this out of small services. And OK, this may be writing stuff and it's going to S3 and then something else reading it and doing whatever, but I can actually see the linear process and it becomes much easier. If you start designing systems that have that linearity or have this flow process, you can work it out. You go, yes, I can see your business process in the architecture. Can I see business process in this architecture? No. OK, that's sort of kind of monolithic. That's part of the problem. But actually, you're going, there's some stuff happening. It's going all over the place. It, it, it doesn't happen to be that particular thing, but they're all like that. How do I avoid this? So this shows the inherent data flow. And now my architecture, my design, maps with actually what I'm trying to do. I can see, where did this happen? So if I've got a problem, I can trace it down the chain and go, it was fine. And I can deal with the fact about idempotence and did this right? Is this, now I can start talking about full and incremental and, and dealing with the problems about it. if it was incremental, I'd resend it to that and the idempotence. I can do all that kind of stuff. We also then move into asynchronous systems. Um, so a lot of systems um, are synchronous. I remember somebody once asked me, yeah, we got this front end system here and it needs to talk to these nine back end systems. And they went, so the nine back end systems are all about 99% and you want the front end to be 99%, unfortunately, you're going to get 91% availability if you've got nine back-end systems that all have to be up called synchronously. It just doesn't work. The maths is not on your side because you have to multiply all those probabilities together. One goes down, essentially takes out the whole thing. So you actually, you end up building brittle systems if you're not careful if you use too, much synchronous, too many synchronous calls. They're great inside a, a process or inside a machine, but across machines, no, they don't. They, they typically don't. If you've got uh, a cluster with Kubernetes and things starting up and down, yes, you've got a service that gives you a staple thing, but, but were you in the middle of that transaction when it went down? You don't know. If you use asynchronous ones like this, 10 systems, each 99%, the whole thing is 99%. You get to decouple it. You get to see each part working by itself. You don't have to have everybody agreeing out a thing all the time. It's like, let's try and agree when we're all going to meet up. And you have to get everybody all at once to do that. It's a very hard thing to do if you try to arrange to go down the pub with 10 mates. It's going to take a long time to try and get a time. Whereas if you do it asynchronously, uh, it's much easier to do on an individual scale. The other part about this one is if you have, over time like this, if you have a synchronous query or operation like this, you end up having to scale for the peak. Because as you add more, this peak just goes up. And also, your response time is typically limited by how long it actually takes to do the operation. If you use an asynchronous one, you say, well, OK, I'll just start this one here. You've reduced this. You've reduced the peak. You've reduced the amount here. And then you're processing it in the background. And you're now scaling based upon average, not on peak. Um, so <laughs> I was once asked to look at a, a system that was doing warehousing. And they had a once a day process for recycling all the crates uh, that would go back around and, get, and redistribute them. Um, they started running out of crates. So somebody did a quick hack and they said, right, OK, we're going to run the crate routine after every um, barcode scan. Well, there was a major problem with this one, the fact that it just deadlocked horribly all the time. Uh, and so what it meant now was that instead of having a very short blip like this to a, an operator of half a second or less. It was now going to be five or 10 seconds to run this entire thing every time, slowing down the whole warehouse, uh, except when it deadlocked. And of course, then this was in a horrible state because, because you've got multiple things going on. They're all running concurrently. Whereas if you queue them up, you can then do them in, in a, um, a one at a time fashion, serially, and therefore you avoid all the deadlocks. So uh, it can be very useful to do that one. The, um, Lambda architecture is essentially doing this one. It's doing asynchronous bulk updates on the top. This is asynchronous on the top. This is synchronous on the bottom, essentially. And then you merge those. You may find that metadata 
is currently up to date sufficiently. That's uh, one of the things to, to, to look at. Okay. So this, this sort of kind of linear thing like this, we can now decide, well, actually, look, we could also put in some asynchrony here. But now we can get to choose this one because our message broker here becomes a synchronous call to the message broker, and then it deals with all the retry and handoff. So uh, we've essentially given ourselves some of this asynchrony here. We've taken out some of the problems of, of synchronous calls. We can do it point to point. We can also do broadcasting if you're using that, or SNS in, or, or equivalent, or event busing of some sort. So it's a nice synchronous way of doing this one. The other thing about this one is it means that these don't have to be up at the same time. A lot of the world still runs on flat file transfers. OK, I dump a CSV file out, and then you pick this one up, or XML in between systems. There's a reason that's popular, because it's very simple and allows you to retry stuff. So if, this is, if my asynchronous thing here wasn't a message queue, but was somewhere on a file system, that's fine, actually. Um, and people say, oh, this is they, they apologize to me and say, we're using flat file transfer. And I said, you know what, it works. I'm not going to argue. And I can test it because I can go, yeah, I want to test this guy. I got file in, file there, file there. I can test that really easily, that service by itself. I don't have to have the rest of it. So let's not have big REST APIs, which are all synchronous, which are all, haven't got rules in them, et cetera. Let's not build more and more fragile systems. <laughs> There's an additional version of this one here. I don't know if you come across things like Kafka and, and uh, Kinesis, which is the Amazon version of Kafka, which basically is like a message queue. But instead of when you're reading from a message queue, it's, it's a destructive read. You can only read something once. This basically just records them in a big long log, and you can decide when to read. So I go and read here. Oh, I got it all wrong. So actually, in terms of things like this, if I, I'm not having a destructive read like this, I can then go, well, I can go all the way back and I can reprocess yesterday's data because, you know, there was a bug in our code. Uh, right, okay, go back to yesterday's data and reread all the stuff off Kafka, reread all the events because I'm going back to base data. With Kafka, I can, I can choose where I read. It's not the queuing system that chooses where I read from. So we can now have idempotent queue reads and keep reading the same thing if I want. It's up to me, not the queue. Let's have another little uh, simple example. Um, I have the joy of having to deal with people with uh, WordPress sites or Drupal and other content management things. Um, and one of the big problems I see from an architectural point of view is that the editing of the code and editing of pages, et cetera, is in the same place on the same API as trying to serve the data. These are completely different things. I want uh, one or two people to be doing editing. It's a complex thing with preview and rules and lots of other things like this. And when it comes to serving, this is everybody, and I want it to be very fast, very secure, and rather dumb. What have I done? I've jammed the two things together into one box into one API called the CMS. It becomes much, much simpler. If I say, look, I'm going to edit this stuff in one way, and then I'm going to store it somewhere, probably in some fairly dumb store like this, and I'm going to serve this. One of the things, for instance, that I, um, I'm tempted to do these days is to go, well, OK, that's WordPress. That's fine. You want to use that for the editing experience? Right. I'll just, do, I'll just screen scrape it. I'll use, w, I'll use wget recursive, go and do basically spider the site, put it onto, onto static, things like this, and then just serve it out through a web server. I've now been able to decouple this and this. I can make this work completely static. CDN, it's read-only. Great. How many people have had their WordPress things hacked because all the admin pages and all the slash admin? Just look in your firewall logs as to how many people are trying to hack into this bit when they should be only looking at that bit. If your e-commerce system has got the shop back end available through the internet, you are making a big problem for yourself by doing this vertical thinking rather than this nice separated one. I can make this, you know, I can do this as a VPN, internal network, etc. Push it out, publish it out to something else. A slightly larger example. This is a project I worked on last year. Uh, consumers register something here. They push it into the database like this, uh, and then this 
is being pulled from here. Notice I'm actually marking where this is push and pull. Essentially, I pull that database into the place I'm going to serve it. The client's doing lots and lots of high-speed queries on this one here, and I'm pushing out logs or, or audit logs out here. Notice what happens when I go push, log. OK, but then I have some log analysis, and I'm going, ah, where's that going? How many of you go, yeah, we'll just do some reporting? Oh, we'll do some analysis. And you go, who's actually going to do the analysis? Where, where's that going? Who needs it? What are the requirements? What are the reporting requirements? Well, I don't know. Well, you better find out. You better find out what this is about and where this is going because you've just got to kind of pushing it into random thin air at the moment. So often I find that this kind of flow-based stuff makes me go, this is the process. I can see this one here. Now I begin to understand where it comes from. Rather than this vertical thinking of, yeah, I'll do that one. OK, actually, how do I get the data in in the first place? How do I go here? How does if I go back to a content management thing like this, it's like, where, where does content come from? I'm starting to ask questions about what the upstream of this one is. Oh, if I have got this serving thing here, and that goes out and it starts producing uh, logs and records, and so what's happening about my log files? If you actually look at an architectural view, you go, it's not this big. People, a lot of people, well, larger people don't just want this. They want actually the entire end-to-end -end content management process all the way through to log analysis, back through to customers and whatever. It's much bigger than that. This tends to make you think vertically. You tend to look at one box, not at the whole system. Notice this means that often you end up with microservices that essentially have two APIs. One comes in, one goes out. REST tries to jam them into one, makes them think they're one thing. They're not. Please let's not do that. So let's have a little... Uh, Think about uh, what other things might happen with write, reading and writing. If I have a read-write API like this, you think of one representation. You go, yeah, I've got one representation. I write the data in that format, and then I try to read it and do all the queries and everything I need to do. Whoops. Um, well, what happens if I write the data in one format, and then at some point I change it round into some other format that is better for reading? And then I can read it out very simply. This is actually a very useful thing. This is the structure changing stuff I was talking about. And it comes up in a surprisingly large number of places. So we're trying to change the structure from what was good for write into what was good for read. We can do this asynchronously or, or synchronously. It can be really nice if you go, right, I'll write this in here in an asynchronous way and do that one here and then read it out that way. If, this is, if you don't need synchronicity between this, that's a really good way of doing it. So where does this come in? It comes in on Twitter. I've seen this, so Twitter is one. I didn't work on that one. I did work on one that was electricity meeting, meter readings. Uh, it comes along in things like matrix multiplication. If you're doing games and you're trying to do array of structs and struct of arrays, it comes up in that kind of stuff. If you start doing analytics databases, it appears all of that as well. Now, why? This is a very common problem. Once you see it, you'll start to see it in lots of places. Now, if I look at, if I have uh, dealing with uh, tweets, right, okay, so I don't have a Twitter account, that's fine. But if I did, I'd have maybe one or two followers like my mother or something, whatever. I'll have one or two like here. And I write one or two there. And then, so if I write here, then there's two people that read me. My mother and my <coughs> mother's dog or whatever. But they need to read columns. So when they log on, they need to see, here are all the things I'm following. But here are all the things I'm writing that way. So I'm writing rows and columns. Now, that's easy enough when it's only a small amount. So when I've got a small number here, then there's a few people here need to update. So I can do one of these and update two or three columns or whatever like that. What happens when Donald Trump posts? I don't know how many million followers he's got, but there's quite a lot. So you can imagine what would happen. You go, right, OK, I'll write one with Donald Trump here. Now I have to go, ah, OK, so I can either store that in the, this way here, or I can now go, actually, I need to go and update a million plus columns. Donald Trump is not going to be happy waiting for you to update that. So he could, yes, we could do this asynchronously. But actually, the way that, that, um, that it's done in Twitter is that for the high value users, people like Donald Trump, Lady Gaga, people who've got millions of followers, et cetera, Kardashians or whatever, I don't know, there's some popular people out there, uh, is that they do the transformation when you read. 
So when you read here, it basically has got a, like a, a, a future or a promise that says, yeah, yeah, all these ones here. Oh, I'll just go and check whether these are people on the high value list and I'll do it that way. Now, another time when this came up, time series databases. I was working on electricity meters and they were reading 100,000. So every five minutes we get 100,000 readings that says, well, okay, at time one, like this, I've got all these channels here. So channel one, channel two, channel three, channel four. I could write it in the database, just go, <laughs> that's great. And then another five minutes later, <laughs> big pile of stuff after this. Also great, until you come to try and read it, where you go, oh, actually I want channel one there, uh, next channel one is here, the next channel one is there, they're 3.2 megabytes, megabytes apart on the disk, which means that every single point on the graph is now a disk read. I've got an n plus one database problem. Why? Because, well, I wrote it and the format was easy to write, but I can't read it in that format. Because I was trying to write rows, but read columns. What happens when you want to try doing analytics? Yeah, I've got a very wide thing here with customers, and actually what I want to see is the amount they bought one column out of 200. I don't want to read 200 columns and then take one number out of it. I'm using less than 1% of the bandwidth of the, of the disk. I really want to get that entire column. This row column stuff comes up all the time. Event sourcing is another version of this one here. Struct of arrays, array of structs. Do I store my data in rows or do I store it in columns? It's the same problem. It comes up um, in lots of places. Things like HBase and RocksDB, what they do is that they do this uh, so-called log structure merge. What happens is that as you write this one here, they store um, a bunch of stuff in memory, in rows, and they go, okay, when I write it out, I'll write it out in columns. They do this, this re the, the sort of kind of transpose of that in memory and then compact it later. So that's really what CQRS is about, and people haven't really mentioned what that is. And last thing, state management. Um, State management is a real problem in distributed processes. Um, how are you going to handle all the things like transaction, failure, management, availability, and immutability, and all those other good things? Um, can you uh, align your transaction boundaries with your failure and your aggregate boundaries? If I start seeing REST APIs like this with nested entities, I know that I'm going to be in a real problem here because, OK, what happens when I try to update this guy? I can probably be certain that resource A here, one, has got multiple ones of these. Resource B, resource C, et cetera. What do I do about transactionality on that? We're sort of kind of drifting into that whole GraphQL world, which is great for querying, but I'm really not so sure about the mutation side of it. Anyway, so there's that. Um, we then have to deal with failure management. Partial rights, partial failure on rights, the big problem with this one. I ring up the bank and say, go and pay my friend 10 pounds, click, brrr, and the phone goes dead. I don't know whether he gets the money or not. And now I have to start dealing with querying, did it happen? Do I try it again, but dedupe it? All those other kind of things. They're inherently concurrent. And recovering this state of trying to keep A and B in synchronized is a real problem. Now, the, the project I mentioned, um, about what I negotiated with the client to have this one hour window is because the client said, I want an update to happen here immediately. And I said, well, okay, that means we have to update on our system. We've got 10, 20 servers. Uh, I have to talk to 250 other companies and they've got millions of mobile phones connected with sessions. Um, there's literally no way I can make this immediate across essentially a million mobile phones. Um, can we have some time delay, please? Uh, and that was really, really important. I'll mention that in a, in a moment. So identity of rights. Be careful with that one. Make sure you can do that one so you can rewrite these ones and get around some of these partial failures. Maybe you have to check points so you can roll back. Um, just another one that pops up. Uh, you may have come across these two models, but not necessarily in these, um, under these names, the Bell-Lapidula and the Bieber Integrity model. This is the top secret one. You go, well, OK, with top secret information here and public information, top secret can always read the public information. That's fine. Uh, public can always write up here. That's not a security problem. So that's, uh, this is pushing, essentially, data going up that way. That's fine. But read and write are quite different for this one here. But then we have the Bieber integrity model, which is the complete opposite of this one. If I have a train system and I have a train signaling system and a departure board, um, 
I'm quite happy for the train signaling system to write data to the departure board. I would not be happy going the other way around. Um, and I'm quite happy for the train departure board to read the signaling system. But so that can read up and this can write up. They are quite opposite. You do so read and write are quite different. Are you going for confidentiality or integrity? Take your pick. You really can't have both at this point. Immutability. Um, immutable data is very useful for this one. Reference data being immutable is uh, great. Um, there are th techniques like Russian doll caching, uh, MVCC. So um, MVCC multi-version concurrency control inside databases that say, well, actually, I'm going to keep all the previous versions of this one here, and you can just tell by the transaction number. So you can't, you can tell whether when you start, that's essentially time, and you can't see any changes after that. Uh, Oracle and Postgres uh, do that internally, for instance, uh, in ODB on MySQL now does as well. Um, Russian doll caching, something that um, things like Rails do very well. So Ruby on Rails, you go, well, I have a big structure like this. I think this was uh, Signals 37 and uh, Basecamp. This is a classic example, this one. Yeah, I've got a project with lots of stuff like this. If I change one of these things, that basically invalidates this one, but that invalidates the parent. But the parent then goes, oh, I need to rebuild. But actually, look, these 19 things are the same, but that one thing is not. So if you add in comments, you can uh, update only partially. Often you do this by changing the key, not the value. So if you start saying, I have a version, if you've ever done things like taking web stuff and putting a, a, a a uh, long caching thing by putting a version number on, inside the URL on your, uh, on your CDN. So you can say, here's my CSS of this version number. You can cache that forever because you'll, you'll change a new one and have a new key. Um, you may come across pets versus cattle as an infrastructure term, which says, so pets are servers we look after and we kind of update them. And this is, we're doing a lot of rights on this one, modifications. Cattle is, we don't care. We'll just start a new VM and it's immutable and we'll just kill it. If we want, a new, if we want another VM, we'll start up another one. Uh, that particular project, we basically said, look, every hour we'll redeploy, but it's a completely new stack of infrastructure. So we didn't have to worry about patching servers or anything else. We just said, right, Amazon, start up a whole new set of uh, VMs like that, get it up and running, thank you, and just switch the load balances. Becomes much, much easier. Um, Single static assignment, which is things that compilers do. They're basically inside compilers like C++ compilers these days. They write stuff out and they basically say, look, here is, I'm not going to change this anymore. You don't go and change registers anymore. And the CPU registers inside the CPU are actually just labels now. Everything's now immutable. Lambda um, architecture is also immutable. The immutability has a lot to, um, a lot to, um, a lot going for it. So last couple of slides or so. Um, have you ever thought about this, about availability of systems? Availability is mean time to failure, between failure, divided by mean time between failure and mean time to recover. OK, so how often does it break and how long does it take me to get it going again? Having stuff with lots of load balances is great and fine. So we can do all this kind of stuff by normal means. We're kind of used to doing this MTBF. What about mean time to repair? As MTBF goes up, this is now the dominant factor. How quickly can I get running again? It's not quickly how often does this break, but how long does it take me actually to work out what's happening? What's going on? How do I get back where I was? And you go, well, OK, do I need to replay transaction logs? Do I need to go back and update states? Do I need to run FSCK or check disk or whatever on the, on the disk to get the state back again? Do I need to do something like that? Minimizing all this lot is now the most important thing for most availability issues because we've kind of worked out how to do all that with load balances and stuff in the cloud. Is this is the thing? Can I understand it? Can I make it? Can I get rid of mutable state in my application and basically go kill it, start again with there? See if you can go that way. So, last slide summary. Let's stop treating read and write the same and see that they are different. Use those in um, some other way. Let's stop thinking about vertical stuff with REST. Let's see if we can start thinking about horizontal stuff with business rule uh, and flow based, separating read and write APIs. Let's just avoid having nice big diagrams with arrows on them like this. Let's start if we can actually understand what does that arrow mean 
Are you pulling data? Are you pushing data? Is it a full or incremental one? Um, what are you doing about that? Are there, what are the protocols, etc.? Let's see if we can move in that direction. Let's see if we can move away from mutating state and having to manage a lot of state and synchronize it towards idempotent stuff with caching and immutability. Let's see if we can do things like do structure changing to avoid some of the problems where we write in one and read in the other. And actually, it, doesn't, it suits one but not the other. Let's see if we can do some structure changing stuff to make the write reorder it in some way that the, the output pages come out uh, more easily. Um, and see if we can add some asynchronous things with events. It's not, not just message queuing, uh, but also can we, instead of making synchronous calls, can we rely on callbacks for, did the payment pass? Well, the answer is, we'll just say we'll take the payment and then we'll con contact customer service if you didn't, that kind of thing, which is actually how, what happens in real life. And let's have, let's have uh, fewer micro data uh, services, of do micro data stores with REST and see if we can actually have microservices that actually have some business logic inside them. Okay, there you go. Hopefully that was, give you something to think about anyway on a Friday afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Stunned silence. That's it's a hangover from last night. Right? Well, this, the talk. No, 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 <laughs> the, oh, no, no, thank you. Right. Well, I'll be around for the rest of the day, probably. So if you have any questions, do let me know. Um,